get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X. Uh, you know, Justin, Tony Horton talked about how he made money as a street mime. That's how he made money uh, for food and his rent. He put a hat out and would do street miming. Um, and he went on to obviously sell hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, RX Bar, uh, which actually sold to Kellogg, you listen to that interview I did with uh, Peter Rahal, um, they sold to Kellogg for $600 million check out that interview and how they built it up. At the time, I didn't even know how big they were. I was just, someone recommended them. And then I got a bunch of texts the day that they got bought and I had no idea that they were that big. Ron Paul Peel, in the infomercial king, sold more than $2 billion of product. You can watch that interview. Um, he talked about how he used to wake up at the crack of dawn to pitch people on his products on the streets of Chicago. And um, Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, um, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, and he talked about, you know, Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000, and he talked about why he said no to that. Um, there's so many more. Go to inspiredinsider.com for those. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and, and customers, and we do that through a couple done-for-you services. One, we have a complete done-for-you podcast solution, which in my mind, I believe, is the best thing I've done for my business and my life, my business partner, I've formed best friends, and obviously referral partners and clients and all of that. Um, it's, you know, I get to talk to amazing people like Justin. Um, and uh, we have a VIP event solution that we partner with large conferences and software companies, and we will put on in a whole done for you VIP event for them. So they can just show up, shake hands, kiss babies, and we do everything else. Um, but the reason I'm talking about this is we have a greater purpose and mission behind what we do. Um, we realized, Justin, and we'll talk about, you know, you talk about some personal things as well. Um, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and he escaped Nazi Germany and him and his brother were the only people to survive uh, their entire family. And when my grandfather was in concentration camps, John's grandfather was a B-17 captain pilot who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany during World War II. So we have... Um, a scholarship to honor our grandfather's legacies. Um, so if you go to rise25.com slash mission, if you were, it's for veteran entrepreneurs and it's a veteran entrepreneur scholarship. Um, we will, it could be an all expense paid trip to an event we're going to with the ticket to the conference, with the ticket to our VIP event or just our VIP event or whatever it is. So if you know a veteran entrepreneur, tell them to go apply rise25.com slash mission. Um, I am excited to talk to today's guest. Justin Goff. Um, some say he's one of the best copywriters in the world. He does not like that at all, actually. He does not refer to himself even as a copywriter, but he helps people make their offers work on cold traffic. Um, he helps scale Patriot Health Alliance to $23 million in revenue in just a few years. And after Justin sold his stake in the company, he's become the go-to guy for making offers work on cold traffic and funnel optimization. Um, he's helped some big names with their marketing, Agora, Golden Hippo, Six Pack Shortcuts, and many more. Um, he has a private email list that has some of the top marketers and business owners uh, who read it. And the funny thing is if you want access, you can't just get on the list. You actually have to apply to get on the list. It's one of the only emails I actually read on a daily basis, and I actually feel guilty, Justin, if I skip over it, I'm like, oh just one email. I need to read it. He spent time on it. It's, it's always fantastic. Um, and you can go to, he, you know, he, if you want to go directly to apply, go to justin123.com. I suggest you don't go there and you go to justingoff.com, uh, J-U-S-T-I-N-G-O-F-F.com, which you can click to apply. But, you know, you get to see a nice sales page for his email that you have to apply for. So, you know, you can skip that and go to Justin123 or go directly to justingoff.com. Justin, thank you for joining me. It's a long time coming. So It is. It is. Thank you for having me, man. This is the most it. I'll talk the whole time. The rest, <laughs> you're going to be doing all the talking. But, um, you know, 
So I suggest Justin anywhere, like I told you before, I've had a Justin Goff marathon and I've listened to hours and hours and hours and, and all the, the stuff you put out is always just high quality content and you guys breaking down funnels and emails and making offers work. So I suggest anyone go out there and, and explore all the stuff that you've talked about and we'll, I'll try and condense it in this time period to some really interesting things I find interesting. And one of the things I wanted to start off with, and there's a whole backstory um, and, you know, the whole story of you and Patriot Health Alliance. But I really want to start with vulnerability because what I love about your emails is the you're super vulnerable to the extent of like, I am like uncomfortable reading some of the emails that I'm thinking, if, would I share something like this yeah. about myself, <laughs> you know? And, and so... I wanted to start with what has been, what's the most personal story you have written about in your emails? And you've written a lot about your parents and, you know, things, your health related things. What do you feel has been the most personal story you've written about that was hard for you to actually release? Um, probably the hardest one. Um, I wrote an email about, so I, I, I'm glad that you brought this up because it's an important topic when it comes to email, not only email, but creating a bond with, with kind of the people who read your stuff, whether that's email lists, videos, however you do it. Um, so I wrote an email once about my mom when I was about 24 years old, uh, and she was not a big fan of me doing online marketing. She wanted me to get a regular job. We would go back and forth on this. Um, I kind of grew up in a family where my mom was like the ultimate perfectionist. Uh, very, very hard on me. Nothing I ever did was good enough. Um, and so she did not want me basically doing online marketing. She wanted me getting a normal job. She wanted, she kind of wanted a job that she could brag about to her friends, I'm sure. So me going in through the sludges of trying to make money online and not doing very well when I started like she probably thought I was an idiot um, but yeah we got in an argument one day I was living in I was about one year out of college living in my crappy apartment that I literally paid $250 a month for uh, my room was like a closet converted into a shoe <laughs> converted I've, into a room. I've lived in situations like that yeah <laughs> yeah um, and we, we, we got into an argument um, and she basically said that I was scamming people online for money. Um, and I still remember that moment. I remember sitting in the chair I was in. I remember what the room looked like, what the TV looked like. Uh, it turned into this huge argument. I threw my phone across the room. I was pissed off beyond all belief. Uh, I was crying. Um, I remember going in my room and just didn't want to talk to anybody. And uh, I told that story to my email list out of every email I've ever sent, that email got more replies than anything I've ever sent. Mm. Uh, one of the reasons is I think pretty much every entrepreneur has gone through the stage of the people who are closest to you don't believe in you. Um, Cause the people who are closest to you- And they have the best you, of intent sometimes, you know what I mean? They, they love you, they you know, and they, and again, there's, there's whole sides of the coin of that, right? Um, it may be a personal thing for them, but also sometimes it, it even comes, they think they're doing you a favor by, by telling you that stuff, you know, they want to like save you. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but even, even if you have the most supportive parents or supportive family, like they still think you're nuts when you're trying to do this and you turn down a job or you walk away from a really good job and you're, yeah. no, nobody gets it besides other entrepreneurs. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that story connects so well. It's one of the reasons I'm such a huge fan of, and it's funny you mentioned like some of the stories make you like uncomfortable. They make me uncomfortable writing them. And that's how <laughs> I know they're going to be. That's they should make me uncomfortable. Well. Yeah. Because yeah. it's the shit that scares you to share. That's what really bonds you with, totally. with people. So what made you finally decide to share it? Um, I'm always looking for really good stories that I think create a deeper bond between me and the people that read my stuff. Um, so I, for situations that I know are common shared things, but especially common shared things that people don't talk about. Yeah. Those, those tend to be, um, 
Like I shared an email the other day about one of the first conferences I ever went to and how I was just like this fresh faced kid who I didn't know anybody. I felt like all these people were like looking down on me. I felt like I didn't belong in the room. Um, and it's pretty funny because now I have somewhat of a name and people know me and people read my stuff and look up to me and they're shocked that I would have ever felt like that. Hmm. They're like assuming that I was just making millions of dollars from, the, from Out of day the one. Of this. But like, I, I still remember the first, the first trafficking conversion I ever went to back when it was still in Austin. I remember getting to the hotel and I was going up the, up the escalator and Mike Dillard was in front of me on the, on the escalator and he has like elevation group, like hoodie on. And I looked, I was like, Oh my God, it's Mike Dillard. Like, total fanboy just like oh my god i've like seen all of his sales pages online i've read his emails um and i'm sure I, it's funny too for me now because i get that now like people like see me at events and they're like oh my god it's justin goff and like <laughs> still really like hasn't hit me yet but uh yeah I, I like to share stories like that where it's common themes or common feelings that people have kind of experienced before that, that people don't talk about. What was holding you back? Like, what were the thoughts going through your head of why you weren't going to publish it? Like, I could think of a few. Um, maybe your mom, maybe it wasn't, that wasn't a concern. Like, do you think your mom was going to read it or get a hold of it? She might, I honestly have no idea. She might be on my email. <laughs> well, that's, that's why you have people apply. Because <laughs> you don't want your family members be like reading about, no. Uh, what I don't were, know. She she might. Um, what were some of the reasons that you were? You know, it's like the devil and the angel, like on one so shoulder. I'll actually tell you what, what's my hardest thing. My hardest thing is, I know from re, from experience that what people want is to see inside my life and for me to share stuff, of what's going on in my life, yeah. and to share, and especially like struggle stories like that. People love I, bonding with you on struggle stories and stuff. Yeah. I know. For a fact, that's what people want and that, but I feel this sense that I need to be giving tactical information and real like hard teaching stuff. Hmm. So that's a struggle I battle with, even though I know just from writing an email every day for two years yeah. that the best stuff by far is when I talk about random shit that almost usually has barely anything to do with marketing. <laughs> You, you can you can relate a bit you relate it back to marketing and, and business though yeah i usually try to um but yeah it's very interesting that it's almost more like a reality show because that's actually what people tend to want they just want to mm. see like what's going on in my life mm -hmm. yep. well you know what what i thought you were going to say was not what you said but um you know i was scrolling through reading your emails today um and you know sometimes it just comes to life when someone actually talks through the story like you just did and so that's why i wanted to hear what you said but what sticks out is one of the best subject lines i've read before i think ever is um you know what i'm gonna say right now no i don't <laughs> um i pooped my pants dot 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes that, that is one of the and great so ones. I mean, I'm just going to read just like two sentences from it because it's, it's so good. I'm not going to – you have to apply to it. If you really want to get the email, I don't even know if you'll get it if you actually apply it right now. But my thought of like this sales page is like you have the king of converting offers on cold traffic. It's like just at the top says, I poop my pants. If you want to hear the rest of the story, you got to apply to the – to get the email. <laughs> but – um. You wrote that was the subject, and I'll have you talk about the business ramifications of this email, but um, you talked about, I just hit my tee shot on the third hole at Firebird Golf Course when my stomach decided to, quote, act up out of nowhere. Oh my God, I'm going to poop my pants, I thought to myself. My, the writing's amazing. My stomach rumbled violently. We've all experienced this in some respect, right? It doesn't matter if you have Crohn's or you don't have a condition. My stomach rumbled violently like there was a wild animal running through my bowels. I've suffered from stomach problems all my life, so this wasn't that surprising. And it goes on. Um, so I don't know if people apply. They even get that, but they should. Um, talk about that story for a second and then about the business ramifications. Yeah, so that was... My when stomach's I was running, turning thinking about it. 
right now. <laughs> when I was writing emails for Patriot Health Alliance, um, we had a digestive product, and I was trying to come up with some stories to use for that, which for me were really easy. So like you mentioned, I, I've had Crohn's disease ever since I was 16. Um, I'm 35 now. Uh, if you're not familiar with Crohn's, it's a terrible, terrible bowel uh, disease that can basically take over your whole life, and the amount of food you can eat is just like narrowed down to like nothing. So like literally my diet right now is steak, chicken, and white potatoes. Really? Uh, that's like literally the extent of my diet. Um, so, so no anyways, cooked vegetables or anything like that? No. Yeah, like I literally eat like three foods. Um, but anyway, so I, I've had this for a long time. And the one thing with digestive problems, which is really funny, which I learned very, very quick, Every single person has a story about some embarrassing digestive thing that happened to them. Everyone does. Nobody talks about it because they're fucking embarrassing. You know, who the hell would want to talk about it? But every, but that's like what makes it great because everybody has it or they've had like a close call where like, oh man, <laughs> if that would have happened, like that would have been super embarrassing. Um, so I actually wrote this email. This is literally a personal experience. I was literally golfing. I think I was in college. I was either in college or just out of college. I was golfing with some of my buddies um, and we're out at this golf course that was kind of by my house. And we're out on one of the furthest holes from the clubhouse and literally like my crone just started acting up out of nowhere. I was like, oh my God, I gotta go to the bathroom so bad. There's no porta potties, no anything. Like 10 minutes later, I'm like literally like running to the woods to go to the bathroom. So that was the basis of the story. And I wrote it from the character who was uh, kind of like the figurehead for our Patriot Health Alliance company. That email, out of the probably three years I was writing emails, got more responses and more sales than anything else I had ever written. Um, people sharing literally like three page stories of like their digestive nightmare of like what happened to them when they're, I mean, most of these people are like 70 years old and they're telling me stories like, yeah, when I was 18, like this happened, me and my friend Bob were out on the boat. And it's like, <laughs> tell you the exact same thing. <laughs> but um, what was really interesting about it was there was also like a lot of backlash. Uh, and a lot of the backlash was this is way too graphic. Like, I don't really? need to hear about this. Mm. And I actually turned that into an email how if you have digestive problems, other people don't understand it and you get shamed for having, like nobody mm. shames somebody for having heart disease, but like if you got digestive issues, people don't understand it and like they don't want to hear about it and you feel lonely and you feel isolated. Yeah. That email connected like crazy too. Mm. Uh, so anyways, it, it was a good, a good way of like sharing these deep personal, I mean, any embarrassing story, like people love to hear. Yeah. Because that went out to hundreds of thousands of people, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, again, like you hook it back into the the business uh, piece, and obviously it happened to be for digestive. But what I, I, wanted to, I wanted to start with that piece first because what you're really good at is, you know, bonding. You, you could talk about funnels and we'll talk about controls and we'll talk about upsells and all this stuff, but really bonding to the client or customer is, is key, you know? So, and you do a really good job of that. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's kind of was my idea when I started my email list. It was, it was interesting because I, I didn't start it with any intent. I literally started it because I had sold my company. I took a year off. I got the itch to start. I had always wanted to talk about marketing and I was like, maybe I'll start a blog and just start writing it there. And then I was like, nobody really reads blogs anymore. I was like, well, maybe I'll post it on Facebook. And then I was like, yeah, I don't really want to share a whole bunch of shit on Facebook. So I was yeah. like, all right, I'm just gonna start this little email list. And so I, I literally emailed, hand emailed like myself, like 100, 120 people who I knew from events and who I've worked with in the past and affiliates. And I was like, yo, I'm going to start writing about uh, marketing every single day to this like small email list. If you want to be on the list, let me know. I'll add your name to it. And that's, that's literally how it started. It was like a hundred people. Um, and then after like three weeks of that, I started getting emails from people who were like responding to these emails who weren't on the list. And they're like, Hey, how do I get on this list? Hmm. And I was like, um, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I don't really have any plans for this, so I'm not sure what to tell you. But then I finally started um, 
basically it was like, okay, I was like, you either can be invited by me or you can go apply and like, if you're a good fit, I'll put, put you on the list. My big thing was I wanted to actually have some interaction with people on the list and I wanted to respond to people. And about 90% of the people who reply, I do respond to as long as it's not some stupid question. Um, and that, that was my whole thing where I wanted people who not like a ranked newbie who is like a biz op seeker who's going to waste all my time, but like someone who's serious about marketing and serious about copy or business. And mm -hmm. if they want to respond to stuff, we can have like a real relationship through mm -hmm. that. That's kind of how that started. So Justin, um, one of the questions I wrote down um, is the most personal story you haven't shared in an email that maybe you're willing to share. And maybe you've thought about it, but didn't. Man. Uh, so it'll be a future email, maybe. I don't know. I'm trying to think. I, I have everything that I feel like is pretty good I've shared. Mm. Um, one of the things that I, I really did like this year that I got a ton of good feedback on was um, – I, I've started working with uh, a therapist named Brent Charlton within the last year and a half. Uh, my buddy Ian Stanley turned me on to him. Mm -hmm. um, basically, after I sold my company, I went through basically about a year where I realized I had all this money, which was my goal for so long, and I wasn't actually happy, though. I was like just as miserable as I was before. Why do you think? And, uh, I went through all this bunch of personal development. I did Date with Destiny. Um, I got into the whole ayahuasca mushroom trip, LSD stuff so, to see if I, that would help. And then Ian eventually persuaded me to go work with Brent. And um, so I went out there and I started working with Brent. And it was probably, I mean, it was like the most life-changing thing I, I've ever done. Uh, I look back now, kind of like the guy I was then versus the guy I am now. It's kind of like night and day, hmm. um, which is kind of crazy because a lot of, it's very hard to see change in yourself, whereas like you can see change in other people very easily, but it's so easy to discredit the, the kind of movement and progress you've had yourself. But anyways, the one day I went out, we did, um, so we, did, we do intensives, like some of them are general, some of them are uh, more in depth on spe specific topics. And the one I did, I did a four day one specifically on sex. And I grew up in a family where sex, money, stuff like that was not to be discussed. Sex, it was like to the point where like if sex scenes are on TV, I get like physically uncomfortable because it's like <laughs> such like a trigger yeah, for me. Yeah, totally. Um, and so I did like a four day intensive with Brent all about sex and it was shocking. He, before we did it, he literally like warned me. He's like, He's like, sex and money are the two darkest things that people work with me on. And he's like, there's going to be some very, very ugly and dark stuff that comes up. He's like, and, and it's, he's like, it's not going to be fun just to let you know. He's like, just, I just want you to be prepared. And I'm like, okay. And during that weekend, I actually wrote about it each morning to my email list. And I was like, here's kind of what I've learned, um, which was crazy to me. I was actually really nervous about writing about that, but it got an insane, an absolutely insane, like feedback. Like people were so excited about. It. They're just like, keep writing about this. Share. Like I, when I got done after the four days, they're like, can you write more? Can you like write a summary? And like, <laughs> what uh, were some of the things that struck people? Do you remember? The the one that hit me the hardest, by far, was how much having sex with a woman to me was connected with my self-worth hmm. uh, and not only that but my reason for existing hmm. so like on an even deeper level like if you had if I had sex with a woman that would validate me as existing as a person which it's a pretty fucking heavy shit to like <laughs> I mean I imagine real. people say the same thing about their business right if they connect so deeply, it's like, well, I'm, I'm my self worth is equal to my what I'm making, right? I mean, that's that's a very common issue I think yeah. with entrepreneurs where like self worth, net worth, same thing, right. which obviously is completely wrong. But yeah, trying to figure out how to pull the two apart because I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs definitely get to the point where 
the money, the lifestyle, the hot girlfriend, I'm kind of speaking specifically to men, but all of that makes up who you are and how you want people to see you. And then when you lose pieces of that, you, you kind of like hit rock bottom and you get shattered where it's like, I don't know who I am. Why would anybody want to hang around me? Why would these people want to be partners with me? Um, I see that with a lot of entrepreneurs. I mean, I, like I said, I went through it, so I'm very familiar with kind of going through something like that deep. Um, but I, I see that a lot. I mean, I'm sure you probably do as well. Like a lot of people are unaware of it, like I was. Um, and unless you're very, I don't know, unless you're a very just kind of aware type person, like I was completely <laughs> naive. <laughs> I was the I was the other way. <laughs> well, so what what do you think? What changed after those four that four day intensive about the sex topic? Um, well, I mean, a lot of the stuff I worked with him on. So, like, even if you work with stuff on like sex or you work on stuff with business it all moves to everything else too because like like I, I have a huge i had a very very big issue with being an approval seeker like everything was about making other people happy and getting other people's approval instead of myself um so we worked on a lot of that that was some of the first stuff we really worked on and for me that's a big trigger with women so we did that, a lot of the work we did around women, around that stuff, really, truly, truly helped me with my business. Mm. Because like when you're working with, when you're working with clients or like when I work with people in my mastermind, so much of that, if you're a people pleaser, you're gonna get fucking worn out and just raked over the coals because you have no boundaries, you have no idea how to like tell people no. Um, you're doing, you're like a guinea pig who just, or a hamster yeah. or whatever who's just fucking running yeah. on the wheel and you, you, you can't, you'll just get burnt out because you can't handle it it just translates across the board you're saying yeah yeah and I mean it's and it's that same approval seeking people pleasing you might do it with women you do it with business people you do it with family you do it with whatever like it just mm -hmm. it's underneath everything totally um, so when you work on that and you kind of kind of remove some of that yeah it removes it from everything so that, that was a big help for me I mean, I see. I saw that in an email you sent recently, actually, and it, it slightly maddened me a little bit. Um, so I'm like, Justin's way too nice. This is what I thought. Okay, it's an email, and um, I don't know Matt. Matt actually emailed you and asked who else is coming to the uh, to your event that's coming up. You'll probably do more in the future. I suggest anyone go to any event you and Stefan do. Um, so we, you know, I, I want to actually put a link to copy Excel, you know, the copy accelerator stuff you guys are doing too. But the reason I thought Justin's too nice is because you actually answered his question. And I was thinking, who cares who else is coming? Justin and Stefan are going to be there. Is that not enough? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's going to be other amazing people there. Right. But I, that was one went through my head. Like, sure. That's good to know. But does it matter? Like you could have responded like in a funny way, but like, listen, I'm going to be there. Stefan's going to be there. Is that not enough for you, you know, to come? Um, but that's anyways, I will get off that. But, but so I just thought to myself, cause you went, you like legitimately answer, answer the person's question. You were nice. You like went through some of the, like the big, big marketers and businesses who are going to be there, which was nice of you. And you could have just been like, no, I'm going to be there and that like, I'm the, you know, that's what you need. You know what I mean? So anyways, I saw that in the recent email. I was like, Justin, you're nice. But, um, you know, on the sex topic for a second, you said something just an off handed comment when you were talking to, um, to Ian and, um, there were questions coming in. Uh, you, I suggest people watch it. It's like two hours of you guys just, you know, riffing on different things. But what, what came up was interesting um, about the kids topic. And you said on there, and, you know, Ian's like, yeah, I'm going to have kids. They're going to be genetically like me, hopefully, or whatever. He was joking around. And you said, I don't want to have kids. Right? And so I'm curious because yeah. I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, I feel like, at least in the circles I know, the entrepreneurs I know, they're getting married much later. They're having kids much later or not married and so i'm always wondering what why that is you know 
Um, yeah, I, I've actually noticed that too with a lot of entrepreneurs. I mean, there's there's a lot to be said for the successful male entrepreneur who is like single and he's 30 some years old and it's like you, you have more time and you have more freedom to do a lot of stuff that the guy with a wife and three kids can't really do. Um, but my, going back to that, for me personally, it's honestly the idea of having kids, if it wasn't so normal, uh, would have never like, it just has never appealed to me. Mm. And I keep trying to like force myself, like why do all these people want to have kids? Like I, I'm assuming <laughs> I should want to have That's hilarious. It's because but like even the more I like think about it, I'm just like, it doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. Like yeah, in a little, in some ways, like the ideas of having kids does, but then when I'm like around kids or I'm sitting next to one on a plane and like think about what actually goes into having kids. Um, I mean, I have kids, Justin, and when I'm sitting next to someone else's kid on the plane, I'm like, this is horrible. No, but it's yeah. <laughs> terrible. But, but so it's not like you're closed off <laughs> but, to it. It's just like, it doesn't appeal to you. It's not like you have a strong. Correct. So I, I am open to the idea that my mind could change. Okay. I'm not like, 100% no kids no matter what. I'm like, it could change, but it also could not change. So I, I really don't know. Um, the one thing that's very interesting about that question, and I find this fascinating, is because having a kid is probably the biggest decision you will ever make in your life. It's bigger than getting married. It's bigger than buying a house, starting a bit, whatever. Else. I mean, and if you're not 100% in tune with having a kid and you don't 100% want to have a kid you're going to fuck that kid up pretty seriously <laughs> because you don't want to have a kid. So it always shocks me. Like when someone like me mentions like, yeah, I'm not interested in having kids and everyone tries to like convince you like, yeah, you got to have kids. You got to have kids. And it's like, there's no worse parent than someone who doesn't want to have kids to fucking have kids. Like, why would you want to put that kid through all that trauma? It sounds terrible. I don't know if Louis CK or one of the comedians says they're just saying that he has a whole bit on it. They're just saying, cause they want you to share in the misery. Like that's his joke <laughs> or it was maybe about marriage, not kids, but like everyone's like, you're single, you got to get married. And like, they just wanted yeah. you to share in the misery. That's his like whole bit, you know? So I think Bill, Bill Burry used to do that. Was it was I don't remember who it was. Yeah. It was, it was one of the, one of the comedians. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had an entrepreneur friend who said that he was more adamant about, no, oh, I'm definitely not having kids. No, no, you know, I'm not changing my mind. And he backed that up. Um, by, I think in his early thirties had a vasectomy. So I'm like, he's really, yeah. Like, wow. I mean, you could always reverse those, but that's, that's like a serious step. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I, you know, I'm just curious cause it's, it's, um, it's something I've seen that's more and more common as far as getting married later, et cetera. Um, so I want to, so what is the website for your guys copy accelerator? You know, I was thinking of that because you said about sharing when you were at that conference and you f didn't feel worthy. And I know Stefan has talked about that before, uh, about, you know, he was at a, a high level event and he, you know, he's emailed about it, I think. And he like found himself wanting to walk away from the group because he felt like he wasn't good enough and couldn't contribute, even though he at the time was really successful in his own right. You know, it wasn't even that he didn't have a business. He did, but no matter what level we're at, we're probably, those things are always going through our mind depending on the group we're with. Right. So, um, what is the, where can people learn more about the copy accelerator stuff you guys are doing? Where I know there's like two versions where one you get like handholding and you guys working in the other is you can be more interactive in the group and get, you know, copy critiques and, and suggestions. Yeah, so we do not have the full website up yet. So great marketer there. So <laughs> I thought you did though. You have some website. We do. We have one for the event. Honestly, the the easiest thing is just to get on my email list, yeah. and then everything flows from there. Um, that's yeah. kind of the way I set it up. Where if you just get on my email list, yeah. you get all the updates on what's going on and the events and the mastermind and all that. So, eighteen control beaters. I don't know how many of them you can share. But um, I get this box in the mail. Um, you had this epic event, Beat, beat Your Control, um, with a great risk reversal of, you know, if you don't get the money back, it was $25,000, I'll pay you double, which is, you know, if it's a $2,000 event, no big deal, $1,000, but we're talking 25000 
you're on the hook for offering to pay someone fifty thousand dollars back. It's not not a small sum of money, um, and but for the right company, it makes perfect sense. You know, because one tweak to their control or email or funnel can mean millions of dollars for them. Um, ta- and there, you shared some of the eighteen control beaters you have seen yourself and your clients. What are yep. some, some you can share? So uh, I'll give you a little, out of all the companies I work with, and most of them are higher end, so businesses doing anywhere from 10 million all the way to 400 million a year. Um, the biggest spot where people are leaving money on the table when they're smart marketers is in their upsells. And I see this every single time I go in and, and either try to beat their controls or I'm consulting with them, whatever it is. Uh, most really smart marketers are pretty good at getting the sales page and the offer and all that kind of stuff right. But they're only operating at about like 50% when it comes to the upsells usually. So probably the biggest, I'll give you one tip that's super easy to implement and that anybody can do. And that is on your first upsell, most people get what I call T-Rex arms when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to their upsells. And I used to do this too. So basically you sell them really hard on the front end and you'll do long copy or you'll do a 40 minute sales video. And then on the first upsell, you like pull your punch, you got the little T-Rex arms and you try to like sell them in this little three paragraph thing or you'll do a two minute video um, because you think they're already sold and you don't have to sell as hard. So every time I go into a company's upsells and all that stuff and I start fixing their stuff, one of the easiest things I do is literally take what they're doing with the upsell and extend it and make it much longer. So if they have a two minute video, it turns into a 15 minute video. If they have like three paragraphs of text, it turns into 15 pages of text. Um, and every single time the conversions go up. So I did this for, uh, Mike Geary and Dave Sinek. They run paleo hacks, which is like probably one of the most successful paleo companies out there. They sell like 300,000 free plus shipping cookbooks a year through Facebook, through cold traffic. Uh, they came to me at one point when their offer basically was losing like a dollar on every single sale on Facebook and they're doing like a thousand sales a day. So that's some serious dough that they're losing. Um, And he's like, can you take a look at our funnel, take a look at our upsells, see what we're doing, see if you can find some holes in it. I was like, sure. One one of the things I did on that first upsell was took it from this short, like three and a half minute video to now it's, I think it's somewhere around 14 minutes. Um, I I did a couple other things, but that was the big needle mover there. Um, And that offer went from being losing a dollar on every sale to uh, profiting a dollar sixty, I think, on every sale. So a huge like two dollar and sixty cents swing, which on a free plus sh- shipping offer is a big deal. Huge. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so for them, that that actually allowed that offer to scale to even higher heights and bring in more customers. Not only that, the offer like was dying, and they would have had to stop running it. But now they were able to run it for, I think they were able to run it for at least nine to 12 more months, which brought them another like 200,000 customers. So that's the name of the game is customers. So that that was hugely valuable. Mm. But anyways, the back it was, the one of the easiest things you could do is literally just longer copy and really go through the full selling process like you would with a normal VSL. Yeah, I'll let you take a couple of drinks. But yeah, we'll get to a couple other control beaters. But I'm glad you mentioned that because on my right screen, that's what I have to make sure to ask you about. Because on your justingoff.com page, Mike Geary is on there. And he says, Justin, I was going to ask you how you did this. Because he says on there, <laughs> was able to boost the order value for one of our free plus shipping offers around $2.70 per customer. This specific funnel is able to do over 2,000 buyers per day for us at one point after those improvements. And still doing about 1,000 customers per day. So... You just shared, you know, I, I was like, I need to ask how he did that, obviously. But you just shared, you know, with, I don't know if you've coined the term T-Rex upsell or something, but um, it's pretty funny. <laughs> um, one they, of the way- Yeah, I mean, you just pull the, everybody does this. I used to do it too, because I assumed that 
if they watched a 40 minute BSL on the front end or read a 40 page sales letter, you don't need to do that again. But the data, <laughs> the data tells you that's completely wrong and you do need to, you gotta go through the whole sales process again. Yeah, and you even talk early on with one of your early successes, how you were breaking even on the front end and how you wish you knew now what you what you you know whatever it is uh, know then what you know now because you were like what's going on because you had some early successes that were was profiting on the front end and you thought that was normal and then yes. when you started breaking even on the front end you're like what the what's broken here right so what would yeah. you do differently back then knowing you're breaking even on the front end. Oh, uh, if I knew what I knew now back, so I had an offer in 2010 on ClickBank called uh, the 31 Day Fat Loss Cure. It became a pretty big hit on ClickBank that year. It was a fat loss kind of paleo CrossFit-ish kind of workout, workout diet combined. This is before CrossFit and paleo kind of really took off in like 2013-ish or so. Um, what was interesting, that offer, I was literally spending like five grand a day on Facebook, bringing in like seven grand a day total. So I was profiting about $2,000 a day. That offer had no upsells, had no back end. I literally did not even like email the list. I didn't even create a list. Like I just <laughs> got buyers and just. That's pretty amazing. ClickBank, like it, they weren't getting anything. Um, yeah, I look back at that now and I'm like, wow, like. I could have probably just like retired off that if I knew what I knew now, because um, I could have scaled that to like a fifty million dollar kind of offer and just made a bunch of money and yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah. So I had that happen. That one did really well. And then um, the next one you were talking about. So I had a supplement, a testosterone supplement called Ultimate Male, and me and my partner Brandon Kelly, when we released that, right off the bat. It was literally like breaking even within like two weeks. But I was so, like I said, I was so accustomed to making money on the front end. And I still did not realize yet that that's not what you're supposed to do. I, I was like, no, you're supposed to like make money. That's how you make money is you make money by <laughs> profiting on the front end. Um, so, so stupid. So like we literally had an offer that, that was like break even after two weeks, which is basically means it's a home run because you haven't tested anything yet and it's already working. So like with some really good testing on upsells and on the hook and on the emails and on the subject lines and on all that stuff, it would have been a home run, like an absolute huge home run. Um, but we honestly like just barely ever ran the offer cause like we would pick and choose these little lists that we would profit on, We'd just run it to that instead of all the lists where we could have ran it and been like break even just so so stupid i just want to like kick myself now that I'm I'm just, <laughs> didn't mean to bring it up to make you feel bad about yourself but it's an interesting That's lesson right, right? <laughs> yeah but um i want to talk about some great upsell examples that you can think of but i mean that became apparent to me when, i think you were there the brian's titans of direct response co uh, event i think it was in 2014 and and um you know, the founder of Guthy Ranker, um, you know, the obviously proactive, and they were talking about how, I don't know if you remember this, but they don't break even until like, whatever, two years after the customers. 18, 18 months, months after commercial errors. Right. That shocked the living hell out of me. Right. Yeah. So what were you thinking at that time when you heard that? What's funny is I heard that and I don't think it really like, I didn't apply it to my business. Like I didn't, I still did not grasp the idea. So I'll tell you actually when it turned around for me. Yeah. When I read Ready, Fire, Aim, Michael Masterson's book, and he specifically beat me over the head with a hammer saying like, the goal on the front end is to acquire as many customers as possible, especially when you're in that like scaling from zero to a million phase. You acquire as many customers as possible. Uh, at break even or whatever your number is that you kind of want to hit. But, and he kind of laid it out where he's like, if you have a hundred thousand customers, you got them all at break even. Now you have this email list or this database that you can make millions of dollars from a year because you have all these customers who are buyers, which to me right now seems so brain dead simple. And it's like, yeah, no shit. That's what you do. But like, 
the first time I read that, I remember in Ready Fire Aim, it was like one of those like baseball bats of the head moments. I was like, oh, okay, now that makes sense. Um, yeah, so that's one of those ones where experience taught me that, and I really wish I would have like grasped that, truly grasped that concept yeah. sooner because it would have been a game changer. Yeah. Sometimes we need to be beaten over the head like ten times before we realize. Um, so I want to talk about some great what you've seen as some great upsell examples, and I'm, I'll do a quick plug for Brian Kurtz's Over Deliver book. So if you haven't checked it out or don't know about it, check it out. It's amazing, and, and the fact his bonuses are, of course, he you know he practices what he preaches. His bonuses are ridiculous as far as over delivering. So check out that book. I think it's I don't know if it's overdeliver.com or wherever it is, but just search Brian Kurtz and Over Deliver, and you'll find it somewhere. Um, Great upsell examples, Justin. What are some great upsell examples that you've seen? Yeah, so when I teach upsells to, we, we actually just covered these in our in our weeks weeks ago. There's three, <laughs> three. <laughs> There's three main upsell examples that that we go over. So the first one is more of the same. So this is one you'll see in the supplement space a lot. You'll see it in survival space a lot. So if somebody just bought three bottles of your supplement, your next upsell, you're gonna to try to sell them maybe three more, maybe five more of the exact same supplement. Um, one of the huge mistakes a lot of people make is they'll put up an upsell offer and then they won't actually test what the offer is. So the thing that moves the needle the most on upsells is getting the offer right. So in, in regards to that upsell one, let's say, if we tried to sell a fish oil product and we tried to sell a probiotic and we tried to sell another five bottles of the supplement that they just bought, the another five bottles of the supplement they just bought is gonna convert so much better. It's the best offer out of those three. Um, and most people really do this the wrong way. Like they would put the fish oil in there because they'd be like, well, they already bought those. They don't want any more of those. So they'll put the fish oil one in there and then they'll try to test everything on the fish oil one to make it better. So better copy, better videos, better hooks, all that stuff. The reality is that one can only go so high though. It's like, I would say it's like putting lipstick on a pig because it's, you're, you're trying to improve an offer that can't get better because it's not the right offer. Um, if you mm. took like one thing away from this podcast and it was just that, like that thing, that tip alone can make you millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, so that, that's number one, which is just more of the same that always works. It's like the classic McDonald's supersize me. Like I just want a bigger thing of what I just bought. Uh, it works in damn near every niche. Like I have one of my clients who sells, um, newsletters, Chris Evans and Taylor Welch, the traffic guys. So they have a, a monthly newsletter that's like seven bucks and their first upsell for it is we're going to give you all the back issues that you haven't seen yet. And it converts like crazy. That's what you should do. You should sell when people subscribe to your email, they can get all back issues. There you go. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. You go. Um, yeah. So more of the same always works. The second one I teach, which is, uh, results faster. So basically if you're selling an info product on the front end about how to lose weight, you upsell them a supplement that will help them get lose the weight faster. That one's pretty simple. Um, it works very well in a lot of different niches. The third one is done for you. So anything that they're buying, so if they're buying a thing on the front end about how to do Facebook ads for, I don't know, chiropractors, and then the first upsell is here's nine proven done for you Facebook ads that I've already tested that I know work. And I'm going to let you literally copy and paste them and you can just put them right in your Facebook account. That's a hell of a, an offer. That's kind of hard to say no to. Um, so done for you pretty much always works, especially Chris and Dodd told me this once. Uh, that was a great, great uh, way of explaining this. He's like, the reason done for you works so well is because the people in your niche the reason they're buying this stuff is they have no confidence in themselves whatsoever of what they're buying. Like if they're buying a weight loss product, 
they have been fat for so long and they've failed at so many diets. Like they have eight other weight loss products. They have no confidence whatsoever in them in themselves that they can do this. So the more you can put the emphasis on something else doing it for them, uh, the better everything's going to be. And I remember when he explained that to me, I was like, he's so right. Um, but yeah, so done for you works there. So kind of recap more of the same, uh, Results get faster, results faster yep. and then done for you. Those are the three kind of upsell formats that work every single time in every niche. Yeah, I remember you shared this um, when we were at Brian's event, um, and you had actually percentages by of what you've tested, and you had you know whatever it was fish oil and like four bottles of the same and a bunch of other things, and and those was like, well, this converted five percent, this was like seven percent, this is ten percent, and then the other one was like forty I don't know how I remember this. I think it was like forty three percent of yep. the multiple uh, more of the same option. You know, it's like yep. which one would you, you know, choose? And you made people actually do a multiple choice and go through and think about, well, what would you guess? You know? So um very interesting. Um have you seen any like as you're checking out as a consumer that you thought were really good? That Ooh. Um, let me think of this. GoDaddy, I'm very impressed by their checkout. GoDaddy will hit you with like Oh yeah. <laughs> there's like probably fifteen different upsells, <laughs> like they're all on the page. Like it's not like upsell, upsell, upsell. Like it's all kind of like in the thing. They're more like little check boxes that you add to it. But in terms of kind of like more mainstream stuff, yeah, man, theirs is just like shockingly good. I, I, I can't even imagine what their average like order value is compared to like what it was before they when they were just like selling domains. Because now it's like you can get the domain, you can get privacy on it, you can get the email account, you can get someone to build your website. You can get five years of the domain instead of just one year. Like it's just every freaking option you can find. Like I buy the upsell. Yeah, I buy, I buy, I think if I'm on your list, I typically buy upsells a lot just personally. I don't know why, because I like it to be, usually it's results faster. Like you said, the smart ones do results faster or more of the same. And so usually I buy the results faster piece and you know, go to any, you know, you can buy one, but if you buy like whatever, three or five years, you get a much bigger discount on the domain. And I was actually on the phone with their support last week and the guy almost sold me, um, I was doing the math, but they have like a domain of the month or a domain club. And if you're in the domain club, you get all your domains for 50% off. So if you're at a, if you have a certain number of domains, it makes sense to do it because instead of $17 a month or whatever it is, it's like eight dollars. So I forgot what it was a month, but it's some number of domains. If you own them, if you're not in the domain club, it like makes no sense monetarily. They're trying to get a bunch of people in the domain club. So I'm trying to not be as ADD and own less domains. So like I was like, oh, that's just gonna like fuel my bad habit of owning a ton of domains. But yeah, the GoDaddy is a good example. Um, what are some, you don't have to name, list all of them, but in, or go in as much depth. I love the upsell. What are some of the other 18 control beaters that people should think about? Um, so I would say, we, so we actually talked about a lot of this in our copy accelerator group the other day. The biggest thing in terms of, and this is not any like groundbreaking information, but the biggest thing in, in terms of the sales page or the BSL uh, is the lead. And the more you test the lead, the, the smart companies literally have writers on staff that all they do is just write new leads constantly, whether that's video, whether that's text, wh whatever it is. Because and we, we, Stefan and I shared a couple of examples in our group about this where we've literally seen like over 100% conversion boost from just changing the first like three pages of a, of a sales letter. Um, that's freaking insane when you think about it. Um, and a lot of people like a lot of people will hire a completely new copywriter to come in and like write a new sales page or and the reality is most of the time you don't need to. You just need someone to come in and write three or four new leads, uh, especially if you can get a really good person who can write like a, well, like a couple of the specific ones we always go to a really emotional story driven lead. Um, 
that is my go-to by, by far that that works better than anything I find over and over again. Um, if you have one that's like a super like contradictory, so like keto is so popular right now, if you have something that kind of goes against keto, um, that's going to loop people in. Another good one is like a very proof based one. Um, yeah. so we did one, um, I, I, I did one before that. Actually, you see this a lot in the financial niche with like dialing into like this expert who was on CNBC and he predicted that this, this, this and this and Fox News agrees with him and this company agrees with him. And it's just like it's just like a proof bomb like over and over and over. An example is JustinGoff.com. I mean, if you look at it, it's um, you have quote after quote after quote after quote of people who think you're the best thing since sliced bread right mm-hmm. and have helped them and this is a free application for an email right yeah i forgot how many there are i stopped counting after maybe like 10 i don't know there's like 10 of them but but it, it sells right more proof yep. um yep. okay so upsells lead what else um let's see what else one thing that a lot of people don't don't get is that um, so this, we, we have this happen a lot. Somebody has been running an offer for a while, and they're like, "Hey, my offer's dying." So they go out and they hire a new copywriter to redo it, or they'll try new leads and they'll try that, and maybe some maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. And they assume that the offer is dead, um, and the reality is the offer is not dead. It's just that your ads that are going to it are dead. Um, I actually had this personally happen to me with Patriot Power Greens, which was our home run offer that was doing six, 700 sales a day. Um, it hit a point where it really slowed down and I thought the offer was dead. I was like, oh, well, maybe it just, it hit its like, its last legs, like that. that's it. Turns out there was nothing, and I actually tried to change a bunch of stuff on the sales page, and I tried to change a bunch of stuff in the head, and we tried new headlines, nothing was really doing anything. And then it dawned on me, I was like, oh, the emails that we're using to send people there, that's actually what I think is dying, not the sales page, because what everybody sees is the email. The people on all these email lists that we're running it to, they're seeing the same email for five months. So I was like, okay, let me, let me write some new emails and see that. So I think I wrote eight emails. Um, six of them did not work. Two of them turned out to be home runs. And those two that were home runs, literally, not only were we back at where we were, we were even like above that because the two new ones were like even better. So and that, that was a very eye-opening experience to me to realize the further up you are in the funnel, that <clears throat> that's usually where you're gonna get the biggest boost. So, but that one ties back into like the ads. Like people literally are running offers on Facebook where they think the offer is dying and it's literally just they need new ads. Um, the ads are what's dying. Like your ads are gonna die quickly. Like ads on Facebook die depending on how big your, your kind of target audience is, maybe within two weeks, three weeks. Uh, emails, in my experience, die somewhere between three to six months, depending on how big that that target is as well. Um, but yeah, people kind of give up on these offers way too soon when the reality is if you just change the ad that people are clicking on to get there, uh, you can revive everything. Yeah. You know, I love what you said, Justin, about the emails, right? Because most people think, okay. He's a powerhouse, rock star, copywriter. Everything he's right is going to convert. And whatever it was, six didn't, two did. So I want to know what, what was one of those emails that just bombed that you thought was, oh, this is going to be. Because I'm sure in your mind, sometimes you're like, oh, this is, going to, this is going to be amazing. This is going to, you know, you don't write anything thinking it's going to do bad, obviously. What was one that just surprised you that it did bad? Um, and what was one so of the ones had- that did well? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll tell you. So I realized really quickly that our emotional story ones work the best for us. So one of the ones that did really great was the doctor who uh, created Patriot Power Greens with us, Dr. Sebring. Mm -hmm. He's like this 63-year-old dude in like really good shape. Um, He's like 
jacked, like big old muscles, looks great for his age. He, I did this whole story about how he like, he still competes in like competitive wrestling against guys that are like half his age. And he's got like the blood pressure levels of a guy in his thirties. And basically all that was what the whole email was about. How he's just like this amazing specimen. And, uh, he follows the paleo diet, but he's got another secret. And his other secret is he takes Patriot power greens every morning, blah, blah, blah. That email crushed, absolutely crushed. Uh, we had another email like that. That was a true customer story. Um, we had a guy who was a World War II veteran who was basically like bedridden uh, at a veteran's home. His wife was on one of our email lists and she saw Patriot Power Greens, decided to buy it, started giving it to her husband. Totally forgot about it, didn't think anything of it. And she said like, I think it was like five days later, she came back uh, to see him at the veteran's home and um, he was like up and walking around the veteran zone for like the first time in like six months. Huh. And she was just like, like stunned. I hadn't seen him like leave his room. Um, and she, so she kept giving him Patriot Power Greens and she said like his energy was going up and he was going down the dining hall to eat. And she was like, he hasn't left his room in six months. And she's like, this is like insane. He's like, she's like, he's basically coming back to life. He's like all this vitality. And so she was a huge fan of us. And she sent us an email like thanking us. I basically followed up with her and got the whole story. I was like, wow. I was like, we would love to share this with our, with our customers and write an email about them. Um, I was like, we, we'll send, we'll even send you guys some more uh, product if we can use the story. And she was awesome. She was super helpful. Sent us a bunch of like old pictures of him from in the military and mm. all kinds of stuff. And that, that email just absolutely crushed. Um, so the stories, like I said, I always go for the stories, but then I've also had in that same batch, I had one, that was a woman who she was having a lot of health issues as well and her and her husband used to go dancing all the time and she had to stop going dancing because she was basically having too much like pain there was too much pain and she just had fatigue and just couldn't really muster up the energy to do it she started taking patriot bar greens and she said she started to feel like she was 10 years younger than she was and her feet that used to hurt all the time weren't hurting and she was like i had the energy that i had like back when i was in my 50s and she's like, my husband and I started doing the tango again or whatever the hell dance they were doing. And I was like, oh, that's a great story. So, And she did the same thing, sent us pictures of her and her husband dancing at the place where they dance. That email bombed. Did absolutely terrible. <laughs> like, I don't know why. Like, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, this is a great story. Like, there's good drama to it. Um, I don't know. Sometimes, like, one of the big things I've learned with ads and with stories in general is – you just got to throw a ton of shit against the wall and see what sticks because a lot of times I've had ones where I was like, Oh, this is great. And then you put it out and just crickets. Right. And then, so I mean, sometimes like, like I knew the one I wrote about Dr. Sebring was going to do well. I could just tell I was like, that one's going to do well. But like the one about the woman dancing, like I had very, very high hopes. I was like, this is a damn good email. This is a great story. And it's shit. That's weird. Um, thanks for sharing that. The, how did Dr. Sebring come to be? How did you guys find Dr. Sebring? That was really random. Uh, so someone that was one of our media buyers knew him uh, for a long, long time. And he had mentioned to her that he wanted to kind of get into selling books and supplements and stuff like that online. Um, she randomly connected us with him and uh, we had a couple conversations. I talked to him and I was like, after I talked to him, I was, I was like, wow, this guy is like the perfect avatar for who our audience was. Like our audience is 60, 70 year old conservative people. He's like a conservative 63 year old dude who hunts and is from Texas. And like, is kind of like your prepper guy, but he was also like paleo is a, an MD who also is very into the paleo diet. And basically everything our customers believe like he's the exact same person so <laughs> were you <laughs> looking former, for like, a spokesperson at the time or no um yeah yeah not like really aggressively but yeah we, we did want we did want to have someone if someone wants to justin go after and have a deal with a spokesperson or someone who's going to rep how how would you recommend structuring something like that 
So the first step is you start with a test because you're not going to bring them on and pay them a bunch of money if it's not going to work. So like we would always do that where I'd be like, here, here's five grand. Let us put your face on it or your voice on it, whatever. And we'll test this for, let us test this for two months to see if it makes sales. Then if it does, it's like, okay, now we're, we'll start, we'll negotiate like a real deal with you. Uh, a lot of ours were all uh, sales based deals where it's like, every canister of the greens we sell, you get 50 cents or you get a dollar. Um, every one of these you sell, you get this much. So we did, we did stuff on that basis. So, um, I know, I know there's a lot of other ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of things you, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of people who are probably more experienced with these kind of deals than I am. But it, it kind of goes back to how much you want to use it. Like if you really want them to be the face of everything where it's like they're the face of the products, they're the face of the emails coming to them, they're the face of the direct mail, that probably would be a little different. Um, the hardest thing is that they don't understand marketing and they think since they're the face of it, they should be getting 90% of the money. <laughs> and then you have to teach them that no, we could put anybody in this and you're going to get like, 10% we're getting 90% because we're doing all the work barring them having some like huge name and being like Dr. Oz or something where they're actually bringing something to the table. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, you obviously got to find a fair split that works for you both. Um, but the majority of the experts I've, I've talked to and people that I've tried to work with, they drastically overestimate what they think they're worth and, that that's usually a sticking point. In that situation, what do you, what would their responsibility be? Is it just to be the name of it, or do they have to participate in some way? It honestly all depends. Uh, it depends on how you set it up, and it depends on what you want them to do. Like for ours, they didn't have to do really much at all. It was like your face is going to be on it. We're going to interview you to get a bunch of your story. Um, they might help with some of the formulations um stuff like that whereas you could have someone like golden hippo who has dr gundry's offers dr gundry's way more involved with their stuff like he's in all the videos he's shooting video constantly like he's they're doing a whole they're building a whole business the business's name is gundry md like right it, it all just kind of depends on how you want to do do your offer and yeah so yeah. Justin, you know, um, the inception of you and you coming together and, and forming Patriot Greens. Um, and then I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, and you talk about this in your emails. And I, I like how you talk about, you know, play your strengths um, piece. And, and I know Alan and Aaron, you know, they're really good at you talk about how they're good at operations and the hiring and all that stuff. And you don't want to deal at all with any of that stuff and you really want to focus on uh, the marketing piece and the copy and the funnels, et cetera. Um, and so you seem like a perfect match um, as far as that goes. Um, talk about the, the part, fast forward through, um, obviously is, is very successful company and, and uh, product, et cetera, to the, the moment that you decide you may want to um, exit and actually um, you get bought out or however it works what was your you know what were you thinking around that yeah so <clears throat> um, the exit actually was not my idea that was uh, Alan and Aaron's um, so for people listening who don't know them Alan and Aaron Baylor they're two super smart entrepreneurs they were my partners in Patriot Health Alliance and then they own for Patriots, which is probably the biggest survival prepper kind of brand online as well. Um, yeah, we were partners. Uh, one of the issues that came up was that Patriot Health was growing so fast and we shared employees between the two companies and Patriot Health was actually paying the other company a management fee um, to lease their employees. And the issue we ran into was they owned 100% of their other company and they owned only a percentage of the one that me and them owned together. 
and they kind of came to the conclusion that it's not really worth it for us to put all this energy into this company that we don't own 100% of when we own 100% of this other one, which was completely right. Um, so they came to me and they were basically like, we either want to buy you out or we want to get out of the health business entirely and just focus on our own company. So that's really how it came about. Um, it was surprising to me when it happened. Um, but it, uh, we basically, it was like, a, I don't know, five month negotiation. Um, <laughs> and actually a very good negotiation from me realizing like, I talked to a bunch of other people who sold their businesses and like, usually they turn out to be very ugly and people hate it's like a divorce nobody ever talks again you hate each other uh ours wasn't like that at all um ours was good uh, we still work together and do a bunch of shit together so yeah it was basically like what would you say justin on that advice on how it it turned out good or the process was somewhat pleasurable and didn't, didn't turn out like a divorce thing, yeah so one thing that was hugely helpful is we both had a representative negotiating for us. Um, if that was not there, emotion would get in the way too much and it would get ugly. I, I, I felt that as we were going through it, I was like, wow, if, it, if this was us getting on calls every week to do this, this would be freaking ugly. Um, so that, that would be probably my biggest, mm. my biggest thing is you need a representative doing your negotiating and they need one as well, otherwise. How did you choose a uh, rep? to negotiate for you? Um, I chose mine just based on uh, a referral I got from someone. Um, although if anybody needs one, you can feel free to hit me up because <laughs> the guy that Aaron, I was like super impressed by him. I was like, shit, I would, I would hire that guy <laughs> in a heartbeat if I had to do this again. <laughs> was their background uh, as a lawyer or what's their background? No, this guy specialized in buyouts. Like, mm. I had done like 20 years with the bios, so he, he knew what the hell he was doing. He knew like every number up and down. and Yeah, very smart dude. So that happens, and I know you mentioned earlier that, I don't know if it surprised you, that you still found yourself, you weren't happy afterwards. Yeah. Um, so what? talk was, about the, the money hits your account. What do you do? <laughs> Yeah, that was interesting to me. I'm sitting at my house in Austin. I get this multi-million dollar buyout. Something that I've been working towards kind of my whole life, like just chasing money and trying to, wanting to be a multi-millionaire. I get it and I, yeah, it kind of hit me. I was like, that's it? Like, <laughs> where's like, where's like the big celebration? Where's like the big feeling of, um, that this was gonna like completely complete me and all the stuff that I was kind of like secretly hoping for. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the things that where it kind of hit me and I sent me down this path, path of trying to figure out I wasn't happy. Um, so what, one of the best bits of advice that I did get was right before I sold that, I was literally like ready to jump back in and just start a whole, totally new business right away. And I talked, I talked to about four guys who had sold their business already. And I was like, give me the lowdown. Like, what's it like? What should I do? Mistakes you made, all that shit. And the one thing that all four of the guys said was, I'm either super grateful for the time I took off after I sold my company, or I wish I would have took more time off. Hmm. I did not want to hear that because I wanted to start a company right away. <laughs> um, but I, I, I went against kind of what I was feeling. And I was like, all right. I'm gonna listen to these guys, they're all smarter than me. I'm gonna take some time off, whether it's six months, a year, whatever it is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. It was absolute hell for the first six weeks. Uh, it made me realize how addicted I was to working hmm. um, and how guilty I felt not working. Um, that was actually very, very eye-opening. Like, it took me about, like I said, about six to eight weeks to finally get okay with waking up an hour later eating breakfast for an hour and just taking my time with nothing to do, going to the dog park with my dog and spending two hours there and, and not worrying about, am I missing emails? Am I missing shit on Slack? Um, that, the guilt, like I said, the guilt was really hard. It took me a while to get used to that. Um, Cause I, I literally like the first day after it, I woke up at the same time I normally did and I'm sitting at my computer. I'm like, I don't know I'm supposed to be here. Like. 
<laughs> that that was, it was just like robot like hmm. uh so yeah, it was very eye-opening to me. So I wound up taking a full year off. And after about a year, I really just kind of hit a breaking point where um, I felt the itch to get back in and start doing more stuff. But I wanted mm-hmm. to really, really create something. So that's when I started my email list and just, I wasn't really actually doing anything to make money. I was just like, all right, I want to start doing something because the days of going to the dog park for three hours a day and working out, like just started to get a little boring. You're like, I'm too ripped. I need to get back to doing something. Yeah. No, um, Justin, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you um, for your time and for your expertise. Everyone should go to justingoff.com. If you want to skip that step and just apply, go to justin123.com, although I don't suggest that. Um, you know, Justin, thank you. And um, I, there was a book actually I had uh, listened to recently. I think it's called Finish Big by Bull Burlingham, which, which talks about some of those things and how common it is for people after an exit to be, you know, feel like unfulfilled and some of the, the mistakes and things that they go through. So I would suggest anyone to listen to that one um, because it seems almost a little bit crazy when you think about, oh, the, you know, someone gets a large, you know, has a large success and then afterwards it affects them the opposite of what you think it should affect them, right? And so, but it's a re, I mean, it's very, very, very common. And they talk, they break down all of these case studies and stories of this happening over and over again. So uh, people should check it out. Check out Justin's uh, email list if you're lucky enough to get on it. And um, thank you, Justin. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Just you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand